ladies and gentlemen, I welcome all of you to the expert group meeting on methodologies and lessons learned for evaluating the completeness and quality of vital statistics data as derived from a civil registration data system. Now, the meeting has been organized by the Population Division in collaboration with Statistics Korea, or COSAT, thanks to generous funding support that was provided by the government of, of the Republic of Korea through COSAT. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the government of the Republic of Korea, as well as our colleagues and partners in Statistics Korea. Over the next few days, we will hear uh, presentations and discussions on the methodologies used for evaluating the quality of vital statistics data as estimates of key demographic parameters, such as indicators of the level of fertility or mortality of population. Uh, in this way, vital statistics data form a critical input for the evaluation of national uh, demographic trends as part of the UN's uh, production, as part of the UN's production uh, every two years of detailed estimates and projections of the world's population. So it's worth recalling that vital statistics as estimates of demographic parameters can be derived from various sources. This meeting is concerned with the specific situation in which vital statistics data are derived from a civil registration data system with a focus on low and middle income countries. Now this meeting is of interest in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted in 2015 by the UN General Assembly, and which include specific targets and indicators reflecting the aspiration of the UN member states for further improvements in the registration of vital, vital events throughout the world. It bears mentioning that the importance of a well-functioning civil registration and vital statistics system is reflected explicitly at two locations within the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. First, uh, in Goal 16 on peaceful and inclusive societies, um, it's recognized, it recognizes this goal, Goal 16 recognizes the importance of civil registration as a source of information on legal identity. Without legal identity, a person is not fully a person, lacking access to large sectors of the formal economy, and to many public services as well. Therefore, under Goal 16, Target 16.9 indicates that by 2030, legal identity should be provided uh, to all persons. It gives specific mention to birth registration, uh, which is widely recognized as a critical mechanism for providing legal identity. Throughout the world, registering a child at birth is the first step in securing recognition before the law and safeguarding the person's human rights and access to justice. Despite recent progress, the births of more than one in four children uh, under the age of five worldwide have not been recorded. In Sub-Saharan Africa, more than half, 54% uh, of children, have not been registered by their fifth birthday. Globally, children living in urban areas are roughly 50% more likely to be registered than their rural counterparts. In most regions, uh, the prevalence of birth registration tends to be highest among the richest 20% uh, of the population. Sorry, I just arrived on my bicycle and I'm just you know, taking that moment to wipe my brow. But So the second location where um, this is mentioned in the Sustainable Development Goals is under Goal 17, which is on the means of implementing the entire package of goals. And Goal 17 includes target 17.19 on capacity building in developing countries to support national development plans. In that context, it was decided to include indicator 17.19.2, which includes as one of its two elements, the proportion of countries that have achieved 100% completeness in the registration of births and 80% completeness in the registration of deaths. The World Health Organization reported that 72% of all births worldwide were registered in 2016, compared to roughly one-third of all deaths. So while many developing countries still rely primarily on surveys and censuses to estimate the key demographic uh, indicators, a number of lower and middle income countries have now achieved levels of coverage and completeness that make it possible to use vital statistics derived from civil registration rather than household surveys uh, to estimate 
the essential demographic indicator. With that, by way of background, uh, let's speak about the purpose of this meeting. First, uh, the first purpose is to examine the status of vital statistics derived using information from a civil registration system uh, with an emphasis on low- and middle-income countries. A second purpose is to review the state of knowledge about analytical methods for evaluating the proportion of vital events that are registered by a civil registration system and, therefore, the quality of vital statistics data derived from the system. And third, the third purpose is to review lessons learned from local and international experiences with applying these methods in various settings. As part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goal, for Sustainable Development, the overall plan that contains the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the UN member states have pledged that no one will be left behind, which is, which is a defining feature of the new development agenda. In that context, uh, methods for evaluating the quality of civil registration and vital statistics data should offer the possibility of making such assessments not only at the national level, but also at regional and local levels. And moreover, we will need methods for evaluating the quality of such information disaggregated along various dimensions, potentially including income, sex, age, race, ethnicity, migratory status, and disability. Of course, that's a big wish list. A number of methods have been developed or recently improved for assessing the completeness and quality of vital statistics information uh, derived from civil registration. Uh, during the meeting, we will address the following questions. What are the methodologies available for evaluating the quality and completeness of the information collected by a civil registration system? What are the strengths and limitations of the various methods? What are the lessons learned from recent experiences with the application of these methods in different settings? What recommendations can be provided to lower and middle income countries on the best methods for evaluating the quality of their vital statistics data at the national, regional, and local levels? And what methodological research would be desirable in the future to address any pending needs? So the meeting will consider methods for evaluating the quality of vital statistics data, not only at the national level, but also at regional and local levels as well as the quality and coverage of vital registration, because the quality of and coverage of vital registration often varies within a country. Uh, we will also review recent progress and experiences both in OECD countries and in lower and middle income countries, focusing on the use of validation studies that use record linkage to assess the completeness and quality of birth and death records from vital from civil registration. So over the next two days, I look forward to the presentations and fruitful discussions that you will have. Our hope is that the interactions in the meeting will both inspire and enable you to provide useful conclusions and recommendations on the topic at hand. And more specifically, by the, by the end of these two days, uh, we hope that you will, as a group, have reached some concise conclusions with regard to practical advice and recommendations on best practices that can help to inform future work on a set of operational guidelines for evaluating the quality of vital statistics data and the associated civil registration system. In that context, before concluding, I would like to take a moment to offer a special word of thanks to our colleagues from the Statistics Division, one of our sister divisions within the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, for the close and productive collaboration between our two divisions, uh, which has been essential in driving forward the recent work on these topics at the United Nations. Once again, uh, I wish to welcome all of you to this conference. Well, <clears throat> thank, thank you, John, for, uh, for this introduction. And uh, uh, as you have seen in the organization of work that we have related to the meeting, uh, for the first session, we have uh, three uh, uh, presenters. Uh, from the Pacific Division, from the from WHO, and from uh, Karen Carter from uh, the South Pacific Commission, um, who are provide who are going to provide us a bit of an overview about the state of vital statistics based on official reporting uh, uh, through the uh, international statistical system with the UN and with WHO. 
And uh, uh, in the case of Karen, also in the context of uh, measurement uh, and definition of coverage versus uh, commitment. So uh, I will give the floor to uh, Adriana. And uh, the idea is for each of you, uh, uh, either you can uh, present uh, remotely with uh, the little uh, device uh, to move the slide, or you can come here and sit and move the slide the way you prefer. So to you. So uh, let me change the position. Good morning, everyone. The uh, presentation will be about the reporting of uh, vital statistics from supervisors based on systems to the one statistics position. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide a review of the availability of basic statistics on birth and death that are compiled uh, from the records of civil registration systems at the national level. We'll give a global review and by region according to the continent and for the reference period 1995 to 2015. And for this, we'll use uh, the data and information available in the demographic in the non demographic book database as of mid October twenty sixteen. In addition, uh, towards the end we'll provide information derived from the collected metadata which are collected together with the data from the National Statistical Offices regarding the methods of completeness evaluation at the national level as reported and declared by the country. Uh, I'll give a quick background and I'll move uh, quickly in those initial, initial slides which I've included only for the sake of completeness of presentation and I'll move quickly so that we can have more time for the second half which I believe is more pertinent to this meeting. So uh, UNSD, the UN Statistics Division, annually collects uh, official demographic and social statistics of all countries and areas, official meaning that these are statistics uh, that are produced by the National Statistical Offices. Uh, we collect these data through two, annual, through two data collections, uh, annual questionnaires and uh, census questionnaires. Both these collections are conducted every year. The annual questionnaires consist in uh, National Population Estimates Questionnaire, Vital Statistics Questionnaire, and Migration Flows Questionnaire, International Migration Flows. And the census questionnaires are a set of questionnaires that um, contain both uh, the population census part and the housing census part. And they are sent in a more targeted way every year to only to the countries that have conducted a new census or have not reported full data previously. The dissemination is done through the medium of the UN Demographic Yearbook, it is the traditional medium, but Recently, more and more, we are producing online on the output, uh, especially in the record form through the UN data portal. And all these outputs, including um, the UN demographic book, can be accessed through this link that I've included at the, at the bottom of the page. Um, now, we'll focus in this presentation only on vital statistics that are collected, as I said, through the annual vital statistics questionnaire. The template of this questionnaire is also available online. So the countries we send customized questionnaires. They are free fields for each country, but this template is blank and it just shows uh, all the tabulations that um, are part of this questionnaire for which we, we ask for data. Uh, the, the questionnaire itself is designed to be in accordance with the principles and recommendations for a vital statistic system. Every time the recommendations get revised, also this questionnaire has to be revised accordingly. 
The two beginning worksheets of the Vital Statistics Questionnaire are reserved specifically to the metadata, which we ask countries to fill out together with the data so that the metadata can qualify the data that they are providing in the same questionnaire. Um, and here I have listed all the data sets that we uh, try to collect from the National Statistical Offices through the Vital Statistics Questionnaire, like birth by several characteristics, um, uh, death, death by and sex, other characteristics also, um, data sets of income death, people death, abortions, marriages, and divorces, so the entire scope of, uh, of vital events. Um, the aim is to collect vital statistics at the national level. Uh, the only level of, of territorial aggregation below the national level is only by urban and rural residents. We do not collect any data below that. So that is something to, to be looked at probably. In this presentation, we will denote by CRVS births and deaths uh, statistics on births and deaths that are compiled as output from the civil registration system of each and every country. The data after we receive them are reviewed, processed, and stored in the demographic or book database. As I said, we collect also the metadata along with the data. The, the computer, for, which is one of the elements of the metadata that we try to collect, refers to the completeness at the national level, uh, and also for all ages combined in the case of that. So if one part, in one part of the country, the complete, the, let's say the debt registration is not complete, at the national level it won't be complete either. So, um, for the purpose of demographic your book, um, a, a, a computer estimate of 90% of more qualified data considered to cover the entire area of the country. Otherwise, less than 90% data are considered incomplete at the national level. Here I'm presenting some uh, summary charts regarding the status of uh, birth and death statistics, only of the basic ones. So, birth the total number by urban and rural residents possibly, and then aggregated by age of, disaggregated by age of mother. And also the total death, also possibly by urban and rural residents, and then disaggregated by, um, by age of the VT. Since these are the most important data sets for the age specific fertility and mortality indicators. Um, so at the next, this is, these are charts for the for the whole world. So we can see that in the first one, in Figure One, um, the the percentage of countries. So the availability here is presented in terms of the number in terms of the percentage of countries with the reported data um, in the world. So for the period 1995 to 1999, 71% of countries or areas have reported CRVS birth to UNSD. That figure has increased, has increased to 75% in 2000 to 2004, and 73% in 2005 to 2009, and then it falls slightly to 72% in 2010 to 2015. Whereas birth by age of mother, the percentage of countries that have reported birth by age of mother to UNSD is 57% of all countries or areas for 1995 to 2004, and then it, it increases to 59% during 2005 to 2015. And below we have the same information on total deaths and on deaths by age. Um, the, the, the pattern is slightly similar, um, so the, for the last year, 2010 to 2015, 70% of countries could report total deaths from Serbia, and 59% of countries could report uh, deaths by age from Serbia, Serbia deaths by age during 2005 to 2015. The lighter portions of the bar, which refers to the legend entry other, refers to, to the birth and death reported, recent births and deaths that are collected from census declarations during the 12 months or 
another period before the census. And also only two countries, India and China, that used the first VSI and China National Survey on Population Changes. And these two countries are the single separately due to their large, large population. And then the diaper portion of the bar refers to the percentage of countries or areas that have no data at all in the UN demographic group that are based on birth or death from CRVS or from census, which means that these countries probably calculated their fertility and mortality indicators through surveys, which we in the demographic, for the demographic group of purpose, do not select. Uh, I think I already covered this, so I'll move on. Um, here I'm, I'm mentioning the countries that have used census as, as a source as a source for reporting statistics on birth and death. Um, and these are mostly countries that for, for which the civil registration system does not is not necessarily lacking, but it's still in development. Or there may not exist the necessary cooperation between the statistical authorities and the civil registration authorities. Or probably the civil registration is not complete in the some areas are covered well, some areas are not. But so this is this country. And the one of them, there are countries actually which provide both statistics, birth and death from censuses and from civil registration, sometimes incomplete. And this is very useful because that way they also monitor their civil registration system and its evolution of completeness over time. Now uh, there is a bit of analysis by, by continent. This is the situation in Africa. The availability here is given in terms of the number of countries in the continent that with available data from civil registration system in reported to UNLD. So we see that for Africa, the reporting of uh, data on birth from a uh, civil registration system has actually improved. And for the latest period, some countries have reported uh, from, uh, have countries or areas have reported complete CRVS birth and 13 have reported incomplete ones. But still, still for 36 others, there are no data from CRVS reported to UNSC. For this, also, we see a, part, a pattern of improving until 2009, and then it falls slightly during 2010 to 15, with seven countries having reported during 2010 to 15 CRVS deaths that are considered complete at the national level and 12 as incomplete. And here I have listed the, the number of countries that have reported birth by age of mother or death by age. And this number is slightly less sometimes than the number of countries that could report the number at the national level. For North America, uh, also the, 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 the reporting of previous birth uh, has improved has improved in terms of completeness, especially from 2005 to 2009 to 2015. For this, it has remained more or less the same. This is the number of countries. So, for example, for this, in the last few years, it moved from 28 to 29, and then the incomplete ones are say six. And about seven or six countries are unable to to report title statistics from civil registration systems. And these are especially the countries of Central America. UNSD classifies them as part of North America. <laughs> um, and here I have again listed the birth rate of mother and death rate. Numbers of, the number of countries that report such statistics are slightly less. But for North America, they are almost the same, which means that the countries that have complete registration systems are, are able to, to provide um, statistics for total number and by and is aggregated by its characteristics. And this is South America. Um, which, so the level of uh, reporting and completeness remains more or less steady, but it has decreased a little for the last uh, period, probably because of late reporting. So. But it's more or less the same, and the number of countries that are able to report complete statistics has, has remained more or less the same. But, uh, but 
again, there is no improvement. And especially we see that in South America, the percentage of countries reporting incomplete statistics is almost the same as the number of countries reporting complete ones. So the, the incompleteness is an issue with the world with some countries of South America are working. And this is the situation in Asia. As I said, the India and China are not counted here. Uh, they do not have, we do not receive uh, statistics from their civil education systems, only from SRS for India and from National Survey on Population Changes for China, and we receive rates from them. And so also for Asia, the, the, the situation regarding reporting and the completeness has also remained um, more or less the same, sometimes improving a little bit in 2005 to 2009, but no, no um, remarkable improvement. However, it's much higher than, for example, Africa or, or Oceania, the GDP. And the figure, which is pretty much um, complete, and no countries do report. Actually, the one country that we are missing is the whole city. So, <laughs> We have to make special requests to them. We cannot just send the, I mean, we do send the questionnaire, but the questionnaire is so big and it's a tiny country, so we have to find a way to, to get the data in a more, uh, and so, and this is the situation for Oceania. So, yes, in Oceania, actually, the availability of charities, births, and deaths has decreased during the last year. Um, we got work with Karen during this uh, two days, and she maybe it's uh, a problem of reaching out, or it will be the deterioration of their their system. Um, and uh, now I, I this is a, a, a summary in part of uh, the availability of uh, uh, total charities, births and deaths by by period and and region. So again, we can see that the discrepancies that existed among regions still somehow persist with some small changes, and uh, the availability of their birth has improved for Africa. Small improvement, but nevertheless, there's an improvement. And uh, the same, uh, the availability of their birth has also improved for Africa, but has decreased slightly in the last few years. It could be also a delay in forcing or uh, and this is the, the current situation in terms of uh, the availability of uh, PRVS births and deaths for the latest period from 2010 to 2015 uh, by region and by level of completeness. So with focusing only on the world, we can see that 72% of the countries or areas are able to report PRVS births. Out of, out of which 66 countries or areas report complete ones and 16 incomplete ones. And 71% of all countries of the, or areas of the world are available, are able to report, uh, complete, are, are able to report, uh, PRBS deaths, out of which 55% are complete and 16% incomplete. Um, so now, this second part of the presentation has to do with the vital statistics metadata, which we collect together with, with the data in the same questionnaire. So they consist, this metadata uh, questionnaire consists of two worksheets out of, and, and this is the first worksheet. The second worksheet has to do with metadata on uh, legal aid as first marriage, on the way close the life table, on the urban and rural definition, so they are not presented here. So this is the first worksheet, which has to do with the metadata on vital events, uh, on birth, death, infant death, physical death, marriages, and divorces. And we have been collecting uh, these metadata for a long time at the UNLV. Um, they are shared also with population division. And I'd like to thank your Patrick and Lauren, the intern of the population division, for this meeting. Um, Compile the file, one single file, recording the middle part, exactly as it is, without altering it, from all the metadata we have received. And Patrick further doing some programming in R with it in order to consolidate them further for 
Life brought death to me from death. But while still maintaining the company of reporting level of detail, so in this file, output file for each company, one can see the completeness that is reported for birth, for death, the methods that are reported to evaluate the completeness, any notes that uh, any individual country has written. And I was able to produce from, from these outputs the summary tabulation that I'll present below. So here is the unit of tabulation in the reporting country. So the numbers that are reported here are number of countries. There is no percentage of countries in the world because that's complicated. So it's a uh, unit of tabulation in the reporting country. And, and so in the first table, this sheet pertains only to that work metadata. In this first table, we can see that 96 countries have provided a uh, has provided a completeness, has reported a completeness level of 90% or more for their life So 96 countries consider their life board from civilization systems to be complete. And out of these 96 countries, 43 are in Europe, 4 in Africa, 21 in North America, 5 in South America, 20 in Asia, and 3 in Oceania. Six countries have reported a completeness of life birth in the interval 75 to 89 percent. Other six countries have reported a completeness in the interval 50 to 74 percent. And only one country has reported a completeness under 50 percent. And so, in the last, in the two tables below, uh, is given the number of countries that have reported a specific method of evaluating their completeness level. So, 26 countries have reported demographic analysis methods to, they have used demographic analysis methods to evaluate the completeness of the life birth from civilization system. And five of these countries are in Africa, eight are in Europe, four and two respectively are in North and South America, five in Asia, and two in Oceania. And 21 countries have reported the dual record matching uh, as a method to evaluate the completeness of their work from registration system. And out of this, zero are in Africa, eight are in Europe, seven and two in North America and South America, and one in Oceania. And again, here is the disaggregation of the reporting of the methods by the reporting period. And we see that more countries have reported uh, these methods for the period when it ends and after, um, which means an increase in reporting. But what is uh, important here to note is that the demographic analysis is the most used method, the, the broad group of methods that can be, that can be considered as demographic analysis. And after that, is the dual record matching as uh, 21 countries have reported that as a method to evaluate the completeness of their civil registration system. And the same information is provided for the for the test metadata. Um, so 96 countries again have reported um, have reported that their CRV uh, deaths at the national level are at the level of completeness of 90 percent or, or more. Five countries at 75 to 89%, five countries at 50 to 74%, and two under 50. Um, again, the demographic analysis followed by dual record set are the two most used methods. Um, and again, the, the, the period for which these methods are mostly reported is for the period after the year 2000. So that's basically it, and I'll be back in five times. We would also would like to be able to update this report from time to time in order to reflect the improvements that are being made at the, at the national level regarding the reporting of the data and the metadata.
Yes, yes. We, we look at what the, the National Statistical Office report. So we we compare that with the metadata that has been reported earlier. We compare our our section also conducts workshops on the improvement of vital statistics throughout the world. So we compare with other um, information that we might have received from the workshop or in general with the research work that may have been done that we are aware of. And uh, But we generally tend to, 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 to trust and to take the word of the countries for what they have reported, but we also, um, because we communicate very officially with the national statistical offices, we do not get the information from other sources. So what gets reported to us is meant to be really what the countries have studied and have thought carefully, but we also look at the other information. In the percentage of the world population, I I cannot tell because here at the statistics division we receive the data uh, from countries and we do not uh, we do not create original estimates of total population uh, or. That is work that is done by the population division. That, that is why it's in my presentation, also reporting this in terms of number of reporting countries or a percentage of reporting countries out of 230, more than 230 countries or areas of the world. So for us, even a tiny area counts the same in this counting as every other country. This is why I also mentioned India and China, because we are aware of the fact that this is not even in terms of the population, this analysis, and these two countries have a very large population, so I wanted to bring out this fact. But maybe that your question is a better question for our colleagues at the public. Could someone answer? I'll touch on it for this in the next presentation. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm following closely, but I, I'm a little bit vague on how completeness is defined. And to me, to my mind, you need two things. Is over what period are you going to measure? Because there's late registration. And the second is, how do you know what the true number of deaths are? And uh, is that connected to what, what is referred to as demographic analysis? That there's an estimate made from a model or whatever of the true number of births, um, or, 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 or are there other measures that are used to define whether something is 90% complete? Yes, and maybe I, I didn't mention that expression to finish in time, but these metadata that are presented here refer to a reference here or to a reference period. And this summary refers to the latest reference period reported. So the reference period meaning reference period of completeness reported by country. And since the reference periods are um, can be very different among countries and the way countries report their reference periods it is not always exact. Some some say all the time. Some, some say for this decade, some provide a range of years, some provide a single year. But this summary that I have presented here refers to the basic reference year or period reporting. Now, the reporting period and the reference period are somewhat connected, which means that the later the reporting, the reporting period, the later the reference period, it cannot be otherwise. And but if you look at this sheet from which we collect, with which we collect the metadata, one of the, one of the items there is the year to which completeness estimate refers. And so countries write down there the year to which the completeness estimate refers. And in the files that are prepared by country, 
Actually, the years means the completion estimate refers to written there, but they are so varied that it's, different, it's difficult to create a summary of those reference years. So, I'm going to go back and play this So we communicate only with the National Statistical Office, and we, we, we consider it that the National Statistical Office will be the coordinator if they need to ask another agency that more specifically deals with the matter at hand. So we reach out to the National Statistical Office. Uh, and uh, regarding the previous second question, can you say that? Oh, yes, the follow-up, yes. So definitely we look at the metadata and at the data that the country support. We have our validation mechanism. We don't just upload the data. And if we, if we see something uh, which we are unsure of, we follow up with the National Statistical Office. We usually follow up. So as a first step, we, we write to the head of the National Statistical Office. When the, report, when the country is at that was, usually the working person is replied. And then we follow up with them. Um, my name is Hans. And uh, I work for Access uh, on the website. I'm the right question that we asked. Who would be said in the first place? This is the national. But my experience with Access is the engagement of the national. So, for example, you go to Botswana and India as countries for reporting cancer. But if you look at Botswana and India, they have automated certification systems. Give you the number of births registered on the same day, but it's automated certification data. So, for example, if them, Botswana is now number one in the At the latest one, Namibia is also coming out to the they can't really write it at any point of time. The problem is the national statistics office is linked to the civil register. If you go to the Ministry of Home Affairs report, the number of births registered and number of deaths registered is part of the report. In the, but it, somehow the statistics office has completely disappeared. So this is something that we have to look at because there is data. The question is how does that end And I'm very surprised to see in India. I mean, work in India on the so we just, India produces its vital data the course of the world. Of course, today, I just checked in 2013, before that came out in 2016. But I really believe that they cannot give level of registration. They give level of registration of birth and death by this thing, all 700 this So I think, uh, you see, when the report, I don't know who reports from India, whether it's the national or the struggling population. Uh, so there is some problem of communication between the statistics office and the system. And I think if we improve this communication, we have more data coming in from the system. Yes, I can fully agree. And I can say actually that for Botswana, and this mentioned also in my notes uh, prepared for this meeting, there are countries that report both the recent births or deaths collected from the census declarations and their statistics from civil registration systems, even if they are incomplete. And Botswana is one of them that has reported both. And, uh, and there are other countries that do that. So we, we record them both. We enter them both. Thanks. This presentation was very uh, heroic. I think the concerning thing we should actually acknowledge is that the big challenge now on um, the agenda is um, the uh, self national disaggregation. And um, I think in 2017, the 
seeing you know, another goal of this sort of discussion about um, disaggregation by rural, sex, you know, same styles, not from styles, etc. So I guess I'm just wondering what current <coughs> thinking is in terms of the region at the moment, given this long history and tradition of collecting this kind of information through the democratic
So, oops, sorry, hang on. Um, we collect the data at headquarters in Geneva, so we have a global database of all the countries that provide data to us, and it comes uh, in two cases through the regional offices. So for the Americas, it comes through the Ayaho office, and they have a demographic group who collects that data and uh, claims it. Oops, I'll just turn that off. Uh, and the European office also collects data for European countries. For the rest of the world, we contact uh, focal points in countries directly. And uh, MRO has started, to the Eastern Mediterranean region has started to uh, get much more involved in uh, the interaction with countries in their region and, and collecting data as well. So there is some standardization and validation of data goes on at the regional offices. Uh, and then also at headquarters, and that's limited to some extent to uh, identifying invalid codes uh, and causes of death that aren't possible from a particular sex or age group, etc. And, uh, and cleaning the data and querying it where necessary. So this is a plot of the number of countries reporting to WHO uh, by year from nine. Uh, sorry, this is the years to which the data refers, not the years the countries are reporting it to, to WHO. So we started off with a little over 10 countries uh, reported data for 1950, uh, through to somewhere around 110 countries reporting data currently. They're reporting data for previous periods. And uh, at the moment, we have uh, just under 20 countries have reported 2015 data. The typical lag is either two or three years in terms of getting a year of data into our database. And there's a regional breakdown here, and as you would expect, the developed regions and Latin America are the, uh, the bulk of countries reporting. Uh, a number of countries, uh, when, I, when we put together these slides and updated them in the last week, I realized that uh, counting of countries is not a simple task, and the denominators in terms of percentages and so on, sometimes we're getting more than 100%. Uh, France has many countries across the world that are territories and report separately to us and should be counted separately or not, and uh, very tiny Montserrat and places like this, um, exactly how we count them. So percent of country report, countries reporting, uh, the denominators and numerators may not be exactly in that, but it gives you a a reasonable idea uh, of the evolution over time. And uh, what interested me is the, uh, the developed region uh, is lower than I was expecting, and that's because there's a number of small countries and uh, islands and so on that aren't reporting to us. And if you turned it into proportion of deaths or in, in the region, it would probably be much higher than that. Uh, but the other interesting thing was the plateau in the Latin America and then the uh, the increase in uh, reporting for Latin America has occurred during the 1990s. Uh, so quite a substantial increase in it's similar to the top uh, countries now. And of course the, uh, the much lower levels of reporting in other countries uh, with improvements in a couple of the regions, but uh, not much improvement in Africa or Oceania, unfortunately, in reporting to us. There are a lot of data comparability issues in the data we get. Um, the request we make is for uh, national data tabulated by three-digit ICD code, if possible. There are a number of countries report a short list. Richard's going to talk about that more. I'm not going to talk about the cause of death side of it in this presentation. Uh, by age group and year of occurrence, if possible, uh, but we get year of registration from some countries, and uh, we don't always get the metadata to be clear what we're talking, what, what we're actually getting. Uh, it's also not always clear whether the data are referring to de facto residents, citizens only, or include non-citizens. And we know that some countries include, uh, sorry, non-residents. This is tourists who die overseas. So Sweden, for example, included deaths from the ocean tsunami in its database. Other countries don't do that. Uh, there are some countries report for citizens only. So Singapore reports for citizens only which means that they only have a completeness of about 70% according to us because of the so many guest workers. And the, um, the Gulf states are another big problem in terms of uh, 
we asked the Gulf states to report for um, citizens and non-citizens to try to get a better handle on the uh, on what's going on there. Uh, as I said, our focus on course of death data, we do ask the countries to, to tabulate all deaths and have a category where cause of death is not recorded. Uh, there, there is a category for saying uh, cause of death recorded is ill-defined, unspecified, but we found out that there are countries where there's a proportion of deaths that just simply don't have a cause of death and they exclude them from what they send to us. So we've been trying to chase that. And sometimes by comparison with what's reported to the UN or what's on the national website, we can tell that that's happening. Sometimes it's not all that clear um, whether we're actually getting all the deaths. Uh, few countries that report to us um, explicitly align the total deaths and the cause of death data set they send to us with the uh, the number from complete death registration reports, etc., or population registers. Uh, we have, until recently, focused on also requesting the population data for the registration population. So when they report registered deaths, to say what is the population that that refers to. The big problem there is that although we ask them to update the entire series each time we go back and ask for data, most countries don't. So we get a series of incomplete, out-of-date population estimates and it's uh, so when a new census comes along, they don't go back and revise the population estimates that we have. And uh, there are so many problems in the numerators and denominator matching that we have effectively abandoned uh, trying to use the country reported populations as the denominators. It's just uh, too problematic. Uh, also, the uh, the PAHO countries in the Americas cease to collect population data through PAHO, and so we don't get it for them anyway. Uh, there are a number of confidentiality issues in some countries. So, understandably, with very small countries, might be unwilling to report by five-year age group a detailed ICD code for confidentiality concerns, but we've had some large countries also cease to report to us at times. Uh, including my own country, Australia, decided that it was uh, problematic to report national data by five-year age groups because somehow or other we might be able to tell that that cause of death was a particular person. I don't know how, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, we've been negotiating that and um, we're in the process of trying to develop a more explicit uh, WHO data policy that will deal with some of these ethics and confidentiality issues and, and uh, set public standards that we can say this is, this is what we do with the data, this is how we say the data. Uh, I mentioned the reporting age varies in the database. Um, our ideal is to get a single year of age, neonatal, post-neonatal, for under fives, and then five-year age groups up to 95 plus ideally, but 85 plus uh, is acceptable. But we do get a number of countries that report Earlier final age groups, 65, 75, 14 year age groups, and this variation in the in the level of detail on the child ages. There are a number of country data issues where we don't get data for the entire country, and this gets into the coverage completeness issues that I'm sure Karen is going to talk about more. Uh, so here's some of the countries where there are territory issues. Some of that relates to disputed territories. Uh, I guess most of it on that list relates to disputed territories, but uh, there are some others. Uh, Iran, for example, has expanded its death registration to cover all of uh, Iran except the Tehran province, so, which is quite a substantial um, chunk of the country's death. This, uh, when I use the word coverage loosely, to say the portion of deaths in the country that we think are covered. Until a few years ago, we carried out our own demographic um, assessments of completeness slash coverage um, you know, using brass grant balance and, and so on, census data. Um, but we found we didn't have the resources to do that, and IHME and UN Population Division were both doing it anyway, and it seemed silly to try to replicate that and not do a very good job. Our main job is not to be demographers. So in the last few years, we've been um, relying more on alignment with the 
UN population divisions uh, analysis of deaths in countries as, a, as a, an approximate yardstick for completeness, and also looking at the IHME analyzed time series that are based on a, an ensemble of demographic methods, and also at the statistics divisions uh, reports from countries. Uh, and so these are by no means intended to be exact assessments. Um, and I mean, IHME's um, simulations suggest that the demographic methods um, only result in completeness estimates that are accurate to within 10% or 20% in, in many cases. Now this, I think, gets at one of the questions from the earlier session. Uh, this is effectively an estimate of the percentage of global deaths that occur in countries with death data of various types. And so the, uh, the second column here is the percentage of global deaths that are in countries with death registration where we assess completeness greater than 90%, and another 25% in countries with complete death registration. So this 25% isn't deaths registered, it's the deaths in the countries with data systems that are uh, that complete. And then just for completeness, uh, the 25% with other population representative data is the censuses and sample systems. Uh, then uh, the other the other percentages of global deaths we're relying on, uh, on child and adult mortality estimatory surveys and, and so on. Our assessment of the actual numbers of deaths registered uh, is uh, we've done some calculations and I was realizing for this meeting it probably would have been good to, to do it more comprehensively, but uh, we, it depends whether you count India and China um, as representative of the whole country, but uh, we estimate around a third of deaths in the world are actually registered uh, in systems, uh, given that that figure's a couple of years old, and uh, maybe Hai Dong will tell us more about the very recent developments in China, but China has improved its death registration coverage in the last few years with the merger of uh, the, the, uh, the vital registration of DSP systems and, and the expansion of that system. So maybe it's more than a third now could be approaching. Uh, we'll find out if you've got any other more recent analysis of that. As Adriana showed earlier, there's been not very substantial progress in, in the expansion of, of uh, quality death registration data over, the, over recent decades. But from our perspective, uh, we're, we're desperate to understand what's happening with causes of death. There have been a, a number of developing countries where there have been quite significant improvements. And that would include South Africa, although the, the miscreated HIV problem is, makes the uh, Cause of death data very problematic to uh, to analyse. Uh, Turkey uh, has made a huge effort to expand its death registration data from largely urban hospitals uh, in the mid 2000s to uh, something approaching a comprehensive system now. And uh, with ICD code and cause of death in a large proportion of those deaths. Um, Iran, as I mentioned, has expanded over the last 15 years from a fairly incomplete system to one that covers the entire country except for Tehran. And I, that's been the situation for the last six or seven years, so I'm not quite sure why Tehran is such a big stumbling block. Normally the big urban areas are the easiest to expand systems in. And as I mentioned, China has uh, been substantially improving its coverage of death registration. Now, uh, John mentioned the SDG indicator 17.19.2, proportion of countries that have achieved 80% of death registration. I show the numbers of countries here, and it approaches 100. Uh, so this is our estimates of completeness. So these are the numbers of countries that have achieved 80% death registration. Given that there's something around 200 countries in the world, depending on exactly how you count the, the tiny territories, um, we, have, we are getting close to 50% um, achieving 80% death registration coverage, but what would be interesting would be to turn that into a proportion of deaths covered by region, because uh, there's, in terms of numbers of countries, there's many very small countries. 
there and um, the uh, reasonably good appearance of that draft may look very different if you just count proportions of deaths that are actually uh, being registered. We should try and do that. The other thing I'll just mention is that there does appear for the first time since I've been involved in this sort of work, uh, in the last three or four years, there does appear to be genuine political and um, international momentum to improve the VR systems. I don't know whether that relates to the uh, sort of uh, achievement of the MDG final deadline and people looking forward to the SDGs and saying we need to improve our data systems to monitor and the countries want to be able to uh, to do that themselves and not rely on uh, models from from uh, Geneva or uh, New York. Um, but there are quite significant ministerial commitments being made in in, uh, in regional meetings in the last few years. Uh, there are global commitments with the SDGs and the G7 health ministers, etc. And the international agencies are paying more attention and investing in uh, improvement strategy support. From WHO side, um, we have developed a ICD related shortlist to assist developing countries to step into four step registration without having to do massive capacity building and a range of other tools to assist countries uh, with improving their health information systems and death registration. Uh, and then there's financing. Canada and the World Bank are putting money into the global financing facility. Uh, Bloomberg, and I think we'll hear about that also, and uh, a number of the other uh, funding agencies are also starting to put significant funding into this registration. And so uh, there's just an example of a ministerial statement from the African ministers. It occurred in the middle of the Ebola epidemic, I think, or towards the end of it. Uh, so, you know, there was. Um, significant political imperative to say that and do something better about uh, tracking deaths in Africa that hopefully that will translate into political commitment to support within countries to improving systems. I'll stop there. Yeah, can, can you take questions for me? Uh, no, or any kind of personal presentation of the coffee break? If you have a general question you want to ask, you can ask questions now, and then we'll see what's better. Any questions? If not, we can go to Karen. I think it's up to you. Um, I know we're all hanging out for coffee, so I'll try and make sure that we've got this wrapped up in 10, 12 minutes or so. <laughs> um, this is a very intimidating group to be at. I, my background is um, epidemiology, public health. I work for the Secretary of the Pacific Community um, in the South Pacific. I also sit on the Regional Steering Group for Asia and the Pacific, the RBS, so one of those groups that I'm that um, we were just talking about. Um, so I certainly have in the room with me my thesis um, reviewers, supervisors, and uh, various other people that I've, I've worked with over the last few years. What I wanted to do this morning is a little bit different to the last two presentations that we've heard. So we've, we've been hearing about the context of what's available and where we're at. Um, I'm going to step back for just a moment and talk a little bit about the, some of the concepts and put some ideas to you for, for thought. Um, this is not necessarily the way we need to approach things or the way that we have to do it, but just some ideas around how do we take this conversation forward. One of the things that particularly interests me working at the country level um, is the confusion that exists around what are we talking about when we're talking about the RBS data. Are we talking about, uh, so what do we mean by, by coverage? What do we mean by completeness? What do we mean by an assessment of that? Are we talking about a system view or are we talking about something that we're trying to use to then adapt data to generate the vital statistics? And the upshot is that we're doing all of those things. But countries are 
quite confused a lot of the time. Um, and I think in part what we're seeing in both the previous presentations is this concept that the availability of data is not necessarily the ability to produce data. Um, how do we fit this into a bigger context of where does it fit in the system? So obviously the importance of evaluating CRBS data has been recognised in a growing way over the last few years. I think certainly I think we are seeing many more political commitments around improving our vital statistics, in part driven by health concerns. Um, in our region it's very much been non communicable diseases. Um, in part I think this is also being driven by the ID um, discussion which is happening outside of the vital statistics discussion, but a lot of the drive around certainly the SDGs and around um, assessing the completeness of civil registration systems has come from that idea of identity and uh, social inclusion. So two very different processes coming together to look at why do we need to assess the data system. Of course, when we're talking about vital statistics as we're doing over these couple of days, we need our statistics to be at a certain level of completeness so that we trust that they're at a level, we can actually make some analysis on how do we use them for the birth, for death, for fertility and mortality analysis. If we're talking about an identity point of view and that social inclusion, the standard by which we need to, to improve our system is by necessity much higher. Um, if we're going to use civil registration as a means of social inclusion, the people who are less, most likely not to be counted are the ones we most need to count to get into the system because they're the most likely to be excluded from those services covered provision. So we're looking at, at two different things. We want to make sure from a statistics point of view we've got coverage and completeness at levels we can use for analysis. From a social inclusion point of view it's about getting as many people as we can into the system um, and particularly targeting the groups that may be more likely to be now. So when we talk about coverage and completeness, um, these are referenced through many of the UN documents, the, um, the principles and recommendations, the data that's coming out. We talk about both of them, but none of them are explicitly defined. Um, and I, I vary through a lot of documents trying to find a clear definition on coverage and completeness and couldn't get one. Um, so what I've put up is what we use when we teach it in the Pacific. Um, as I said, open for discussion and review. So when we talk about coverage, what we're talking about is the measure of the population of the system services. So who are we trying to target? This is primarily an issue of, of access to geographical coverage. So is it a national system? Or is it available only nationally excluding their own? <laughs> um, so the, the geographical distribution of where can we register these events. There are other things that do lead into that definition. So in the principles and recommendations, there's also a discussion around population of interest, the usual resident population. We have systems where the registry of the vital statistics system does not include foreigners. Um, so in the Solomon Islands, for example, there is a civil registration system that collects births and deaths nominally for all Solomon Islanders, but anyone who's a foreigner who's born, born to foreign parents, dies in Solomon Islands, is measured through a completely different ministry and system and database. And those two things are not combined at any stage. The rules around whether we count overseas yet change quite significantly. <laughs> um, in big populations, this may not have as much impact. But certainly, <laughs> small populations, massive impact. Um, and perhaps more so when we start to talk about cause distribution, but even when we're looking at facility and mortality data, whether we're counting just the resident population on the island or whether we're talking about treatments that are referred overseas and people subsequently die, can have a huge impact on what we see. When we're talking about completeness then, if coverage is who we're trying who we're trying to collect information for, completeness is then the measure of how well are we doing it. So if the coverage of our system is national, then the completeness is how well are we collecting all of the events within that national system. 
the national measure of completeness therefore includes an indication of coverage even if we don't intend it to. So if we're talking about completeness at the national level, it assumes national coverage. Um, and so when we're talking about a statistical use of data at the national level, that's obviously what we're interested in. If we're looking at system performance, or if we're looking at being able to adjust data, it may actually be necessary to, to look at that disaggregation by geographical area and by population service. So that if we're only collecting information for one area, we may be able to look at the statistics for that area. Um, if we're only looking at events collected through the health reporting system, so our completeness from a system point of view may be more appropriate if we're looking at the proportion of events that happen in the health system that we actually know about and record properly. So we use them as interrelated terms, um, but separate them out by who we're trying to find out about and then how well we do it. Both of those things obviously then come together with how representative is our data, how generalizable is those studies that result. Of course, just to confuse matters, we often talk about completeness in relation to individual fields. Um, so the content completeness. How complete is our recording of age or of sex or of place in our, in our data set? Um, so again, we refer to this as completeness, but what, what we're actually talking about is the content completeness within the data we have already collected. So if we've collected 80% of the, the events that we want to know about, what is the proportion of those which we have enough information to then work with for that field? That, of course, can be done collectively for a combined number of set fields. So if we decide that sex, age, and place are the key fields, we can look at completeness across those three, or we can look at it by the individual field of interest. Um, particularly important partly because it affects what we can then do with the analysis, but also because it's critical if we look at some of the methods we'll talk about a bit later on with the, the data linkage, it affects how well we can link that data set together. So if we're missing too many fields, we can't put the data together as effectively as we would like to do and affect our ability to use these other methods. Of course, it assumes that there is an agreed standard on what we're trying to collect and how that information should be recorded. So this comes back to the principles and recommendations and to the national metadata, what we're trying to put down. <laughs> this is a really, really messy diagram. This is me trying to get out of my head how this all fits together. Um, and essentially what I was trying to do is look at, on the left-hand side, we have these big system inputs and influences. So the accessibility, the legislation, the resources. In the middle, we've got these processing steps, working out the coverage, working out the content quality, and using those both to look at how do we affect, how do we look at the completeness of the data. Um, <laughs> and you have to look at the coverage and the content completeness before you can really look at the completeness of the data set as a whole. Understanding those then gives us information to feed back into the system improvements. So hopefully we end up with feedback loops that start improving our system. But then when we want to get all the way through to the right-hand side of the diagram and use that information for vital statistics, it's the coverage, the content quality, and the completeness only make up part of our analysis of the data and the quality of the data. Then we're also looking at these issues of accessibility. Um, and I, I think we've already highlighted some accessibility issues this morning. Um, the policy relevance. Is it something that we can reproduce over time? Again, feeding right background to the overall system. So it's very messy, but it's in the very center of both the system improvement and the production of vital statistics. Measuring coverage, therefore, is potentially an issue of access to the system. So the closest numerical measure that we had was the WHO assessment um, indicator for improving the quality and use of services, course and information. And so that looks at the number of people living in a census enumeration district that has a service. It makes a huge number of assumptions in that, A, your census enumeration districts are big enough to each require their own access point, um, and B, that they're small enough that everyone who's in those enumeration districts could actually be counted. But it's just a measure of how far the people need to go. Oh, okay. 
But coverage is primarily descriptive. So if we're talking about whether we've got national coverage, whether we've got system coverage, what type of event, we're talking about the legislation. Is it citizens? Is it non-citizens? We're talking about system design. Um, we're talking about social and cultural factors. So if there is a massive stigma in place where you can't have the registration of a birth to a single mother, or the system actually requires that you should present a marriage certificate to register birth, um, and unfortunately there's many systems that still require the presentation of a marriage certificate, then the system by design excludes the events which happen outside those conditions. And so our coverage is, is affected and we cannot therefore reach 100% completeness because we're not even targeting those events. In terms of measuring coverage and just looking at the access component, um, measuring coverage is around the understanding of the system description and of the access. In terms of the, the access issues, there's a lot more that we could be doing around the GIS work um, and looking at how far people need to travel for registration, what the proportion of population covered by registration is, who's living in those service areas. Um, I'm not aware of a lot of work happening in this area except um, the previous uh, Disney meeting, I think it was, where there started to be some discussion around how could we better tap into these methods. It's being used in a very similar way for a lot of the education statistics work that's happening, access to schools and how are we counting um, educational attainment. So I think there are bodies of work that we could draw on to look at this more closely. When we're talking about measuring completeness, at its very simplest, what we're trying to do is compare to the truth. So all the methods that we're trying to, to talk about over the next couple of days are how close can we get to a measure of the true number of events. Um, and we've got four sort of groupings of those methods. The first one is very simply a comparison against the standard, something we believe to be true. Um, the second is the direct survey. Um, looking at the events that we know about to another source and whether they were registered. The comparison with the expected distribution of events, so looking at those indirect demographic measures. And then that comparison of other sources which may also not be complete. I'm going to spend very little time on all these because this is the bulk of what we're talking about over the next few days. Um, and there are others who know a lot more than I do. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind those two distinct reasons why we're looking at completeness because I think it affects the choice of method that we use. So are we looking at it to evaluate the overall performance, to report against our SDGs, to report against are we getting the bulk of our population included, or are we trying to get down to the level of detail where we can adjust the data and build up to a life table, to a facility estimate, in which case we may need greater detail about our estimate of completeness because we may need to disaggregate more to get that. I think that also affects the level of resourcing we're prepared to throw at the assessment. Because at a very practical level, those four types of approach have very different resource implications. Simply comparing to a standard, pretty cost effective. Doing a data linkage to a record or multi-record source analysis has a much greater investment cost wise, time cost, um, expertise. So, we may be able to do that, but is that what we need in order to get the outcome for what the country is looking at? Uh, comparing with the standard, the biggest issue here is actually the alignment of time. And so we may be looking at using crude birth rates and crude death rates against it from an earlier period and trying to move it forward to a current period for comparison. And of course, the assumptions that go into that are fairly broad and, and can have a particularly big impact if our, our growth birth rates and death rates are changing. And of course it assumes that our comparison data is correct. So the usual sources we have are the census or the UN um, databases. We're making the assumption that those two pieces of information are correct. Looking at comparison with surveys, um, this is perhaps the most common approach we have for birth registration assessment. So the use of the questions in surveys such as the demographic and health survey. Um, 
So whether the child's birth was registered and whether they can show the interview or a copy of the certificate. Within that, we've got the general issues that you always have around the survey. So no surprises there, the sampling frame, the way it was applied, the potential response biases. But the big impact here is how that question is asked and whether the system has one single collection for birth or death registration, birth, or whether there are multiple things that people may interpret as being registered. So in systems where you have a notification of birth and you get a pretty printout, and you have a birth registration and you get a certificate, it's possible that people confuse those two things and we can end up with a measure that's somewhat of a mix, and we don't know which system that information has been gone into. A modification of that approach that we're starting to talk about um, more broadly across country statistical systems is using enrollments in school and when a child comes up to school whether they've already got a birth certificate. Um, again, huge issues with that because the kids most likely not to be at school are the ones who are also most likely not to have a birth certificate um, and the problems that go around that. So then of course the ones which will make up the bulk of our conversation, the comparison of distribution by age. Um, and there's many people that know more about this than I do, but essentially what we're trying to do is take an expected distribution across the known pattern and apply it to our data set. So does, does that make sense and can we adjust based on that distribution? Um, obviously it's not one approach, it's a, a family of approaches. The advantage is that it's much less resource intensive generally than trying to do a dual linkage or a multiple linkage study. Um, the disadvantage is that in general you end up with a measure that's across groups. So because you're looking at the distribution, the result you get is applied across the whole age distribution. And so you can't then break it down and completeness varies significantly across your age group as it tends to do for death registration. Many systems, and certainly systems in our area, the incentive for registering a death is around land inheritance. And so what that means is if you're male and you're old, when you die, your death is much more likely to be recorded and recorded well. If you're female and if you're young, particularly if you're a child, it's very likely that your death is missed from the, the registration system because there's no incentive. Um, you don't own property pass on. So when we look at these methods, if they give us a, a measure of completeness that crosses all those age groups, it then makes it difficult to adjust the data to get a, a measurement that we can use reliably. It gives us an overall indication of system performance, but not the detail of what we might want to be able to do. Um, and then the, the issue of how do you cross those decisions? Where do you, which age groups do you make? the decision around in terms of completeness. Uh, again, understanding that these patterns of reporting vary significantly across age. When we looked at countries like Tonga, um, what we found is in the health reporting, we had fantastic reporting of, of deaths in children because there's a, a focus in the health system on, on capturing that and none in the national registry system. When we get into the, the older age groups, it was the complete opposite. The registry system had the events and the health system didn't because there wasn't a focus on, on deaths in older adults. And so understanding that and picking which age groups we use can change that method substantially. And then, of course, we've been talking extensively over the last year or so um, and much longer about this record linkage. Um, it's been around for a very long time. It's been used in this field for a very long time, but it's had increasing attention as a method of taking this forward. The advantage is it deals with these disaggregations in a much easier way. Um, so we can look at the reporting completeness by age group, by subgroup, by sex, um, and then use that to adjust our data where the reporting is complete enough. The second major advantage it has is it doesn't assume our other sources of truth. So in our early simple methods where we're comparing against the census, we make the assumption the census is correct. Um, and there are cases where that's a reasonable assumption. There are cases where it's perhaps a little bit more grey and that's maybe not where we want to be going. So the advantage of a, a dual source process is that we don't make that we don't make that assumption. And we can use it to look at both sources of data. 
Um, using only the two, the assumption that they're independent rarely holds. Um, possible for a census, but if we're using other sources, more difficult. Particularly if we're looking then at systems which do not have national coverage, if we're now looking at a system which has health facility coverage or something like that and we're comparing against medical records or we're comparing against nursing um, data, these assumptions around independence don't hold. So what we can do is use them to set some plausibility limits but not to get a direct measure of how complete the information is. Um, of course, the trade-off to the, to the benefits of the data linkage is just how time-consuming and resource-intensive that is. Um, oops, I'm putting the H on that. Oh. Um, so two source assumes that independence and assumes limited movement in and out. Um, the three source or more analysis obviously takes into account those independence issues and has the benefits of working with that, but it rapidly introduces a level of complexity and cost, um, which changes that analysis substantially. I'm not going to talk anything further about the advantages or disadvantages of that because Ramesh hosted a, a very good meeting on those earlier in the year, and I'm sure some of those findings will be discussed in a later session of this. So what I want to finish up with just quickly, because I know everyone's dying for some caffeine, is that this summary is, is these multiple approaches that we can use to measuring completeness. The decisions about which ones we use, first of all, have to depend on the coverage of our system and what we're trying to actually collect information for, the completeness of the data within that system. And then it becomes an issue of what are we trying to achieve? Are we doing a broad system analysis to get an overall indication to report to the SDG, or are we trying to get a very detailed analysis that we can then use to create mortality security estimates to create a life table from adjusted data? Again, another very messy diagram. This is in the, the information that's being circulated. I don't suggest this is the right way to do this. This is just one possible way that we might start to think about how countries could make that decision about how you assess completeness. So working through, is your system coverage national? Um, why are you doing the, the system assessment? Is there a national survey or a DHS that you can compare against? Or do you need to go down the path of doing the record linkage study? Is that why you're trying to actually get So with that, um, I know it's a very rushed <laughs> picture, but essentially what, what I'd like to do is to start to get us to perhaps work towards a more coherent language when we talk about coverage and completeness. Um, I think we manage to deal with it fairly well when we're talking about analysis and expert group meetings and things like that, but there is a huge confusion at the country level about what we mean. Um, and there's already, as you can see, quite enough complexity at that level in making a decision about what you might want to do. Um, not just about whether you can do that method, but whether you actually should invest in that method and what you want to use the results for. So if, if we can start to agree on a, a framework around how we talk about coverage and completeness, um, I think that will help.